Better to start at the beginning, don't you think? All right. So um, we called this a non-devotional, or excuse me, a non-devotional, a non-dual <laughs> devotional path, uh, the spiritual young friendly path of David Hawkins. Because this is the Jung Center, we'll definitely tie some things into the Jung, Jungian psychology for those of you who spend a lot of time with Carl Jung. If you don't know Carl Jung, it'll just probably confuse you worse to have us comparing somebody you don't know to somebody you don't know, but I think it'll be better overall. Uh, and most of us do know a lot about, uh, about, or at least have spent some time with Carl Jung. I'll say this is about revisioning consciousness. That's what it was for me. It was like, oh, this is a different way to think about the consciousness trip. And uh, I thought uh, it's, it's clearly the psycho-spiritual journey. And it's one non-dual approach. If you don't know the word non-dual, we'll get into that in just a minute. I wasn't really using that term very much a year ago. I use it more now. But it's about optimal human choices in all social settings. So yes, this is about your individual advancement spiritually and growth spiritually. But it clearly has uh, the notion that the journey that we were all on is from self, right, small acquired ego-based self and not ego in a bad way. You got to go out and make a living and have a profession and do the normal things human beings do. But it's, our, but it's the journey to the bigger self, the core of you, the essence of you. And it's about a beneficent society on a globalized planet. So we'll be talking all about us and you and individually. We'll be talking about that. We want to make many comments about the, the social implications of this work, but it definitely has that. And in a time when the world is hurting quite a bit, as we all know from all kinds of things, uh, let's keep that in mind. And a fast way of saying that is individual work has collective implications, big social implications. So we'll start with a little bit how, who is he and how did we get into him and what we will cover. So Phil, do you wanna go first and tell your story? Okay, thank you. Um... Well, first of all, I'm so delighted that John is running this thing because I, I wanted to do this program for some time, but I don't have anywhere near the skills. And, <laughs> and John, John is not only uh, wise in his spiritual life, but he's also got the uh, computer skills that I was lacking. <laughs> so I really appreciate this, John. Um, how I got involved at, uh, with Hawkins was uh, actually through uh, Nancy's daughter, Mary. Uh, Nancy was my wife who died a few years ago, and she was very involved in the, in the young, young Association, and you probably, lots of you know her. Um, but Mary, there she is. Hi, Mary. <laughs> and uh, she's, uh, she's been on a spiritual search forever, I think. And she ran across uh, Hawkins in, a, in one of her workshops and uh, gave it a, a power versus force to me for, for a Christmas present. And I, t I took to it right away. It, I, f I finally, I'd been on a spiritual search for a long time too. And I finally found somebody that really talked to me, um, talked to the language I could understand and, uh, and made so much sense to me. Well, all this, you know, this, this, this is my person, this is my guide. I have a few other guides too, spiritual guides, but uh, this is my main one. So I appreciate Mary for all she's done. She and I have studied uh, uh, Hawkins since, uh, and, uh, and so we've become very close through that. So. Okay, John, thanks. <laughs> that Phil, well, Phil was instrumental in me intensifying my exposure to Hawkins this last year. COVID had a lot to do with it too because I got very internal and all kinds of work was canceled. So I had a lot of uh, opportunity to do some inner work and uh, I was hanging out with Phil some. We were seeing each other on occasion and uh, I started uh, reading it more seriously. So I read Power Versus Force probably six, seven years ago, liked it but set it down, didn't pursue anymore. Then I read Letting Go back in 2017. I, I read parts of it, I didn't finish it. But then um, Phil, uh, probably back in February or March said, John, well, and he had been mentioning Hawkins to me 
on and off, gently persuading me to spend some more time with it for a long time. Finally, I succumbed, I surrendered, I said, all right, and sure enough, it pulled me in. And uh, I, uh, that, so mine's pretty recent, and, uh, and that's why I'm really glad Phil is here, because he's, he's had a much longer run at this than I have, but uh, it, 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 it rang true for me, and it's been intense. I've read his four books. I have to thank Virginia McCauley. Thank you, Virginia, for giving me uh, she gave me four books to four of his books to read and it was wonderful <laughs> so i started i started uh, uh reading those books and i just finished the last one about a week ago so um what we cover the basics uh the big features of his thinking that impacted us some ties to young and i'll do a little bit on his bio he's got a very interesting bio and so that's that's what we're going to try to cover today and uh a word about the continuum of psychology and spirituality. If you can't go ahead and read this, I'll stay out of your, I'll, I'll be quiet for about 10 seconds while you read this. One of his quotes. So you can see from this, that Hawkins is saying the primary goal of spiritual work is to set aside the ego. Uh, you can't find the inner kingdom within unless you set aside that ego. And uh, finding what, and so he spends a lot of his time really uh, exploring the nature of the ego. And uh, I'll, I'll just give you one little, little thing that he, he well, I'll, I'll wait until a little later to get, get to that. But uh, this is one of his really fine suggestions to me. Keep it simple. One simple practice, spiritual practice, is worth a lot more than adding tons of thoughts and ideas. And it's not an acquisition process, spiritual growth. It's a letting go and releasing and freeing yourself up. And so examples of this are to be kind to all and everyone always, to revere all of life, or to repeat a deep mantra of devotion or surrender. That, that's what makes this guy holy that's what makes him going after the sacred. And although uh, you can equate Hawkins in, uh, with uh, other things, because there are other things he talks about, and we're going to go into those other things first, we're going to come back to, by the end of our time this morning, what this devotional path is. Remember, we said it's a, it's a, <cluttering> it's a devotional non-duality path. And it, it's the part that most moved me, and I think Phil as well. Um, so you'll see us talk about that. Phil, anything you want to add to that, or am I, have I covered it enough? I think you've done a great job, John. <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> so here's what he talks about. He says, when we go from to our deeper self, it's about the progression from hearing about something to knowing it, to doing it, and then to being it. He wants you to embody the truth. So you all be the change, right? As Amanda Gorman would say, be the change, or as Gandhi would say, be the change you want to be in the world. So this is not about knowing about, it's about, uh, it's about essentially embodying what is there. And that, of course, is, is difficult. But here'd be the path. Psychological, we all have psychological bones in our body. They are obviously tied to spiritual parts of us, psycho-spiritual. That leads to spiritual psychological, meaning you tend to think more spiritually than psychologically, and ultimately it leads to spirituality. I would say Hawkins is on the spiritual, psychological, and spiritual side. There are parts of him that are truly psychological, however, but this is the continuum that we'll be talking about today. And uh, so if we head towards the spirituality part, it's on purpose because he leads you there. And uh, it doesn't mean the psychology is not extremely important. One other thing I would say is we all know some people who have done a lot of spiritual work but haven't done that much psychological work. They tend to cast their shadow into their spirituality. There are other people who have done a lot of psychological work and don't have a spiritual bone in their body. <laughs> you know, that's just the way they are. And so we're not saying wrong or right here. We're just saying it's the psycho-spiritual. It's that middle range where you work both together, psycho-spiritual, and you pop out, hopefully, on the spiritual side with a different you. A bit of a bio on him. He was Midwestern born, I think Wisconsin or something. Early experiences he recalled later. He had a number of visionary experiences as a young boy. Not a number, actually a couple of really strong ones he 
he writes about a lot. He had a huge psych psychiatry practice. He's an MD psychiatrist in New York City, I think. And it was very successful. Uh, and so he writes about that and he studied psychology. That's why he knows about Jung a lot. It's a big practice. He knew and appreciated Jung quite a, quite a bit early on. Uh, <clears throat> he wrote a book with Linus Pauling, if you know that name, the great scientist who won two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry, one for the uh, nuclear test ban. So he's got chops in the scientific, normal, uh, mainstream, Western culture, scientific world. He's got chops there, but chops, fancy, word, silly word for, he's got credentials. He could have pursued that. And the whole time he was pursuing truth. And, uh, and so that's what led him to then, uh, many years later, becoming a spiritual teacher. In his own words, he, he hit a level of despair that was anguishing his atheism. Now, how did he get into atheism coming from Christianity? It's a long story, but all the suffering in the world made him believe there couldn't be a God with all this suffering. But he had a conversion experience and enlightenment. He, he writes about that. Uh, not unlike uh, Eckhart Tolle, you know, if you've read The Power of Now, he had a conversion enlightenment experience on a bench in London. This, that, that's, that's Tolle, The Power of Now. This would, be, this would be Hawkins. And then Hawkins went into decades of silence, Dec literally. He had to try to assimilate from his westernized, successful psychi psychiatric practice world to what this meant. He went silent for a long time. And then he, the end of his life, he came out in Sedona and did about maybe 15 years of teaching. And Phil has a lot of cool videos. That's what I do over at Phil's house once a week when I'm around. <laughs> and we watch these videos and discuss his, his books and, and then, of course, try to apply them to our lives. So, but there's a lot, that's where his books came from. So that's the bio of the guy. Yeah, let me, uh, let me just jump on one thing. Please do. Expanding a little bit on, on uh, his relationship with Jung. Um, uh, Hawkins uh, was a psychiatrist, so he went through analysis, but he did it with a Freudian. He had a Freudian analyst, and so he knew that very well. But, in, but then he met Jung, and he studied, obviously studied Jung, and then in all his books, I never saw any reference to Freud, but I've seen many, I've seen many references to Jung. So he's he's converted, if you will, and he has become he became a a, a, a very uh, strong young enthusiast. Just wanted to add that. Okay. Oh, that's, that's, no, <clears throat> that's good. I didn't know he actually met Carl Jung. Yeah, yeah, yeah they they met. Right. Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah, he gives Freud credit for what he did. I heard a funny phrase the other day saying, Freud was fishing in the unconscious, but he was fishing while he was sitting on the back of a whale. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it took Jung to say, whoops, we're on a whale here and, and to take it farther. So um, so that's, that's, that's Hawkins. <clears throat> okay, here's the big idea, spiritual growth. I've already talked about that. Dissolve that ego. He tells you not to fight the ego. It's not the enemy. It's just, unfortunately, it's a whole set of bad habits. Is a lot about the levels of consciousness. We're going to spend some time on the levels of consciousness. Show you some graphics here, um, <clears throat> because uh, he he's and I'll give you one frame for it. Is he gives us a, a frame to try to help the Western mind understand uh, understand consciousness. And so you'll, we'll we'll explain that in just a bit. Um, and then we'll spend the last part on his devotional side and his humility side. And uh, we'll talk about the non-dual side as well. You can't not talk about that. So, and that's a picture of uh, I took in a cedar, a cedar path in uh, uh, out near <clears throat> out near uh, San Francisco, California. It's a beautiful path. So, there's our path. All right, let's talk about the levels of consciousness. We're going to spend probably maybe 20 minutes on different angles here. Phil, I did get a couple of pictures. Uh, I, I had to draw one, so it's gonna, but you'll see, I, I did, I think I did plug those in here. So it's an arbitrary scale of one to a thousand. Now this, this is part of a construct. He, he admits it. He says, this is my construct. <laughs> it's zero to a thousand, but I want to help the Western mind understand, because we like to think like this, you know, there's, um, 
seismographs and we, we tend to measure energy waves. And he said, well, let's measure this and I'll put out something. And um, by the second bullet there, it's a means to help the Western largely left hemisphere rational mind. You wouldn't need this if you were in other cultures that, where we weren't so rationalized, but we are. And so I'll talk a little bit about the scale of, 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 of one to 1,000. 1,000 would be like the avatars, you know, Jesus and Buddha. And the, the one is an amoeba, all right? You know, you just very, and then there's human consciousness is this large scale in between. There's big transition points and 200 is the first one. When you get to the level of 200 is when you start to individuate using our Jungian language. This is when you come out of tribal consciousness or what, what Jung called the participation mystique where you were just kind of moved around by tribal energies and you really start to individuate and you move ahead with courage and, and, and make choices. Uh, there's other, he, he writes beautifully about this. The book I'm holding up right now is called Transcending the Levels of Consciousness, but this is in many of his books is this, is this scale. 400 to 500 is reason. And he has many wonderful things to say about what intellectual growth can do for us, including we can spiritualize our ego and our intellect in a good way. In other words, make it long for that, which is beyond itself. 500 is a big transition. This is when you enter love. The love space comes dominant. You could say this is when the right hemisphere or the heart starts to take precedence over the left hemisphere and thinking. And so then he, he says a very natural place for you to, to uh, a very practical goal for all of humanity is to go to, for level 540, which is sainthood, unconditional love. He just says, just become a loving being and this is it. And 540 is that level. 600 is the enlightenment level. This is when you go into the nonlinear. This is when it's all one, you know? Um, and so, We'll, we'll, we'll show you a few more graphics here about this in just a bit. Um, that, that little uh, uh, link into YouTube, he, he's, by the way, uh, there's lots of YouTube stuff on Hawkins. You can find him lecturing there, including an interview with uh, Oprah. Oprah found him, <laughs> of course. She was finding all the, all the spiritual teachers when she was doing her Deepak Chopra and all the rest. Muscle testing is a big part of it. I'm going to let Phil talk about kinesiology and Dr. John Diamond's research. So Phil, why don't you take it away? I'll be your PowerPoint man here. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah. Uh, kinesiology or muscle testing is uh, it's very uh, general, large uh, activity. And um, the general definition of it is the, the study of human movement. That's the, de the definition of it. So it, it comes up in things like uh, sports medicine, uh, designing a chair, uh, cockpit of an Alex, and so forth. Well, during the 1960s, 1970s, um, a psychiatrist named John Diamond developed another branch of it, if you will, and I think many of you may be quite familiar with it. It was testing medicines and uh, food products and so forth, whether they were healthy for you or they were not healthy for you. And how he did that, uh, if you may know, is that he had the person put their arm out and and what, what he found out is if the medicine and so forth was not beneficial for him, the arm went weak. But if it was beneficial for him, the arm was strong. And that's the kinesiology that, that we're talking about. We're talking about this really because it's, it's kind of the foundation of this uh, whole levels of consciousness and this part of his, his uh, contribution to the world. There's so much more that is beyond this, but it's, I think it's, we think it's kind of helpful to uh, have an understanding of this, uh, even if you never practice it and so forth, you know what the foundation of his of his study of his work is. So he found a way then that he studied. He actually studied under um, uh, uh, Diamond, and uh, then he, after his conversion, he was in Arizona and so forth. He started looking at things 
from a bigger perspective of how he could help you know, everybody in, in the world. I, I think a psychiatric problem was, was a very large practice was kind of burning him out because he was having to you know, work with one individual at a time. So he's looking for something where he could help everybody. And what he found was uh, he turned to, to what he learned from Diamond and, and Hawkins' big contribution, I believe, is that he found that anything that was not true or supported life or is integrous, your muscles, your muscles of your body momentarily went weak. And I'll test this, Phil, if you have me on the yeah. screen. Yeah, this, this is how he does it. And then uh, yeah. the person yeah. comes up and uh, makes a statement and that if, that if that's a true statement, it stays strong. If it isn't, it goes weak. So the two of us can't demonstrate that because we're in different places. <laughs> but um, so anyway, so based on this uh, work of being able to find out what was true, what was beneficial to life and so forth, he developed this and that along with his in-depth knowledge of of psychology and spirituality through his own experiences and so forth. He was a very evolved, evolved, evolved man. And um, so he put that together, but this this muscle testing and so forth is, is kind of a, a part of the story uh, that's not understood very well uh, at times. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit after John is going to talk about the levels of consciousness and then I'm going to come back and talk about how you use those levels of consciousness again using the muscle testing. So we got kind of a two-part thing here. Right. Before, before I leave though I want to tell you about another part of the testing. Um, the part that I use <laughs> a lot. Um, if you if the if your muscle all if if thing is not true or beneficial to life and so forth, everybody's muscles go weak. So the person who is actually doing the testing so forth, their muscles go weak as well. So what Hawkins um, what Hawkins uh, advocated and, uh, and and he defines in every book that he has. He's, every book he has has got instructions on how to do the, the uh, muscle testing. Um, so what he said, instructed was that an individual could do it by, by making a, a, a kind of a circle of, in their hand, the one hand, and then pulling and setting up the other hand. I hope you can see this. Put him, put like him on speaker so view. The circle and you hook on to it like this. Okay. And then you ask you know, ask a question, um, or, or you don't ask a question, you make a statement, which is what you say. So well, let me say that, uh, for example, uh, today's date is February 14th. It's not February 14th. Today's date is February 13th. Strong. Today's day is number February 11th. So that's the idea that, that your, your muscles go through. So there is this uh, the individual test that uh, I like a lot. I, I live alone, so it's very convenient <laughs> for me. And I, I do a lot of testing of that. Uh, Mary and I did a lot of testing with the arm in the early days, and uh, we got quite amazing uh, good results. Um, it's, it's something that, well, we'll get into a little bit later. It's something, though, that you got to work with and get, get and gain confidence in. It's not something that you're going to adapt right away if you do it at all. And many people don't. I'll talk about that. So that's that's muscle testing. Uh, so bitch, back to you, John, about the whole level of consciousness and yeah, muscle testing 101 right there. And just I'll add a little bit. Thank you, Phil. Uh, the uh, One of the things that uh, Hawkins says about muscle testing is he said when they were first doing it, uh, 
he thought it was uh, about the meridian, the, the acupuncture meridians in the body. He thought that was first what it was about. He said after a while, he, he did enough testing that he realized, no, this is about the field of consciousness itself. And so it was much broader application than just uh, his original thinking about it. And I thought that was very interesting to talk about. That's good. Uh, very good. Right. This is the uh, one way he, he has lots of charts that he would put out in his lectures. Remember that amoeba down there? That'd be far in the left-hand corner when uh, consciousness on the planet was very low because humanity and higher life forms hadn't been created. That went on for a long time. See how long it took evolution to start to get uh, a little some consciousness in it. And then we got stuck for a long time humanity under 100. So the scale that goes from 50 to 250 up on the up on the left. And he said, uh, look at look at the way that curve skyrockets. Now it's kind of a, a algorithmic, what do you call it? Uh, exponential curve up, right? Log and logarithmic. Yeah, logarithmic. Thank, thank right. you. Logarithmic curve up. Uh, there's our engineer speaking. Thank you, engineer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but that's the good news is he has a he has a very hopeful view. Now we we not we may not make it as a species. We could always wipe out the planet first. But if we make it as a species, it's because we've been working hard for you could say millions of years of evolution, hundreds of thousands of human evolution evolutionary years. And, and maybe millions there too. But at any rate, we're on a nice steep curve. And so he has a very hopeful view that if you really apply yourself spiritually right now, there is so much spiritual information available now across the world. You used to be confined to one tradition when, you know, 100 years ago, you'd be raised and you're, instead it's everywhere now, there's great teachers. There's also lots of falsehood, lots of temptations, but the good news is that we're on a good path as a, as a species. Now, Here's more of what he talks about. He calls these the levels of falsehood, going from the bottom there. See the shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, anger. This is in all of his books. There's the number he attaches to him. Shame and guilt are the low ones. Those are the ones where you really have no spiritual energy whatsoever. And apathy is real close to that. See, it's down there in the 50s. Um, grief is at least you care about something, you know, but you're still despondent if you see this. The, the, oh, that shouldn't say scorn. That should say, oh, maybe, I don't know what that should say, scorn. Oh, I know, that's for pride. Yeah, never mind. That's not a, that's not a, uh, the top blue is not a, a scale for the others. All right, sorry about that. It's just a different color. Um, but finally, when you get up to uh, desired, better things start to happen. You'll still be enslaved and addicted if you're not careful, but at least you now desire something. It's better than apathy. <laughs> and anger is better yet because now you care about something. And pride is better yet because you want to acquire. So in other words, there's higher levels of lower too, but you're still caught in the ego traps of the lower side. He calls them levels of falsehood. And so um, he, he writes uh, extensively about these in, in ways that I thought were quite useful. Phil. Yeah, I, I just got to add a couple of things. Um, is, is this also the level of energy that one has you can see that this, the lower levels have much less energy. Something like anger has a lot of energy. Um, and so this is also kind of a measure of energy. The other thing I wanted to just comment on is grief, because um, this is a stumbling block for a lot of people that I've run into. Um, people say, well, it's good to grieve. Um, you know, it's a good thing to do is grieve. And they're right. What this is talking about is somebody that's stuck in grief. That is, it's really kind of a pathology uh, where they actually can, that they just can't get through the stages of grief and they remain there maybe for years and years, actually, some way. So this puts grief in that, in the perspective of being something that's low energy and is, is kind of a, uh, it is a bad thing if it just hangs on forever, but normal grief is a good thing. It's it gets you work your way through it, and so forth. But okay, so the, <laughs> ego can get attached every every place, as John Mellencamp said in his famous rock and roll song, "Hurts so good." Right? All right. So you, <laughs> we all know what that's about. This was me last night pretending I could draw. 
and I went ahead and did a little graph. Uh, he would say uh, th this what's what's important about this graph is kind of the where where he is humanity distributed here. And see that little dotted line down there at 200? You can see how the huge preponderance of the volume of human population is still to the left of that, meaning humanity is still struggling to get above 200 over much of the world. America still has a pretty, we've got a pretty good uh, consciousness level here in our country, uh, in spite of recent regressions probably, but if you, if you count the millions of people right now meditating and doing mindfulness and the huge number of spiritual, not religious, who hang around at the Jung centers around America, right? <laughs> You've got a lot of people who are trying to push the envelope there. And you'll see the, it's 15% to the right of the dotted line and 85% to the left. And we're trying to, uh, people are trying to get it to the right side so they can start to individuate. You can see how rare it is to get to 500. I think he says it's maybe 400, 4%, excuse me, 4%, 0.4 get to 540 which is that sainthood, unconditional love thing. Uh, in the, those precise numbers used to put me off, by the way, because I'd say, how can anybody, he's a spiritual engineer. Here I am, I'm a Jungian, I like metaphors, I like archetypes, and now I'm putting numbers on all this stuff? It was, it was a jarring thing for me to do this, and if this doesn't, if this isn't a part of it that you relate to, uh, let it go. I also thought, uh-oh, the, the ego is going to acquire this and start judging people, you know, because the ego can acquire and appropriate anything. And so just be loving about this is, is the point. And don't, uh, don't worry about the skill. But I think it's very helpful. And I don't know anybody else, any other spiritual teacher who tries this, attempts it, tried to put it in a scale for us so we could learn from it. I think he does a wonderful job. I've surrendered to it. Uh, I probably don't use testing as much as Phil. I'm not as confident yet. I haven't had a Mary to be an, an assistant or a, a colleague with to do all the coaching, but I like it when Phil does it when I'm around him. So, so that's another uh, distribution scale for you. Here's the levels of truth. Here's the good news. Courage is where it starts. See down there at 200. Neutrality is kind of that uh, release from, from being uh, too connected to any particular, uh, you, know, you start to have tolerance for others. You, you, you trust that there's a goodness about others and you release a lot. Willingness, that optimism, acceptance. He would say a lot of industry, for instance, is in the 300s. He would say the 300s are great places to be. That's why I like marketplaces. I work in businesses because there's a lot of 300 energy where people are, yes, they're trying to make goods and services and make profits, but if you do it in a good way, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. People can advance and grow there. Reason is the big one, 400. That's the enlightenment for sure. The Greeks started that. They were, the, they were so wonderful at giving us our minds and our capacity to be rational and think. And Aristotle and Plato were, you know, still live, they're still alive for us today in terms of the fundamental thoughts they put down. Uh, but then of course the scientific revolution took it farther and farther and farther. And a lot of the great thinkers who don't have a spiritual side stop at 499. They're loving, they're doing lots of good work. You would say Freud was there uh, and uh, hooray for them. They're, they're doing good work, but they can't surrender. And if you remember one of Jung's great, great contributions, I think to my life was when he suggested that you really, if you wanna keep on going on this path, uh, an adult has to surrender to that which is beyond them. And it's, so it's an argument for theism, or at least for a supreme being, a supreme knowingness somewhere. And without that surrender to love and that which is in the heart, beyond the mind, you can't get above that 499 barrier. You see 540 is the joy place, hooray for that. He says, shoot for that, that's a very practical goal, just become a loving being, that's all you have to do. And, and then of course 600 is the big one, where you truly do achieve enlightenment. And uh, um, so that's that's the good news. So that's that's the levels of truth, and it's a bit. He puts it in front of you so much, so often that if you're going to read Hawkins, you got to confront this scale and think about what's he trying to do here. So there it is in one place. Can I? Right? Can I? Can I go back a little bit, John? Yeah, please. Yeah. Please. Um, yeah. I just add a little bit to what John was saying. Uh, the uh, the other two columns over here, the the one are ineffable at the top. That's the dominant emotion. 
at, at say a level of peace is bliss, level of joy is serenity and so forth. So that's how you read this scale. The other one is, is kind of the results um, of, of that level. So this, this is what this uh, gives you. And as John is, is saying so well, uh, this, is, this is an arbitrary scale that is, they're just, it's a very helpful tool that, uh, that you can use in your, in, your, in your spiritual and psychological path. The other thing I wanted to talk about because we're, we're tied in with, with Young so much is that, that uh, people, uh, most people, you know, people like uh, Freud was at 499 and so forth. And most psychologists in the world, because they're, they're working on the ego and so forth, are in the 400s, usually in the, the high 400s. Young was one of the very few psychologists that broke into the 500s. And his level of, of, of uh, consciousness was, was 522. So he, and this, this you can see in this, and, and this is probably what attracted all of us here <laughs> that are attending that the fact that, that uh, uh, Young was, you know, was at this, this high level uh, and broke into the five, 500s, where most psychologists are in the 400s. So I just wanted to add that. Uh, it's a big but add. John said it was okay for me to jump in and talk. <laughs> big add, yeah, this is the way we're, it's a little frick and frack here show, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop here in just a minute and, and take any questions on this part in just a minute. Let me just say one other thing about it. Um, if you read Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, most of us Jungians have uh, a couple times. You know, by the end of that book, as, uh, as he was nearing the end of the life, you could tell <laughs> he had gotten more acausal. He had decided that cause and effect was really more about synchronicity. Life was more an emergent process for him than a, a spiritual process of emergence than it was cause and effect. And... Uh, um, and he truly is, you can, you can feel him giving, you can, you can sense in his reading, he's giving up his, all that rationality and, and, and thinking that he had, and he's going to his heart because he, end he ends up very humble at the end of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections saying, you know, I'm not sure what I know anymore, but I know I have a kinship with, plant, with, 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 with plants and animals and the world as it is. It's a beautiful acknowledgement of the oneness that he's, he's starting to feel at the end of his life. And he's not negating what he did in his earlier life so much as he's saying, I'm in a different place now. So um, if, if Jung had the collective unconscious as his uh, controversial concept, right? Jung had to explain the collective unconscious for decades because he got vilified for that and all the rest. I would say this, this scale right here is the part of Hawkins that might be his collective unconscious. It's the part that it's for me the most controversial part of him, yet I think uh, you know, you'll have to decide for yourself whether or not it's useful for you. The good news for me is he's so useful even without this that uh, I find him inspiring in all kinds of ways. There's the scale that you can find in one place. It's all over the internet, of course, and that's what it looks like when it's in one place. There's some colors attached to that that are probably all tied to what colors do for us and what chakras he, he knows chakras he's you know he's he's a knowledgeable guy uh, here's the guides to testing so phil you want to tell us about this yeah okay yeah we um john and i were talking about kind of coming back to after we after john explained the level of consciousness which is you know kind of fundamental to hawkins's work is how do you use the level of consciousness to, to get what you want, what get the kind of answers. And you use it through muscle testing again. Um, and it's a very simple process. And so I'm gonna, rather than talk about it so much, I gotta demonstrate it, uh, what you do. And uh, to do that, um, I've got a book here that, that uh, is Joan Halifax. It's, it's what I'm trying to try to, I try to do is get the level of consciousness of this book, the, the contents of this book, what's the level of consciousness, and what's the level of consciousness of the author. This is the book that our aging with attention group is, is having to working on. 
And so it's, so, so okay, so you just kind of set that here and I'm gonna do the, the, the single muscle testing. Okay, like we'll this. We'll put it on, on uh, speaker view if you want. What's, what's that, John? We're putting, if, if, if we can put you on speaker view and we can see you better. Oh, okay. Just keep doing your thing. We'll we'll blow, blow me up. Yeah, yeah. You got a nice big. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Blow me up. <laughs> okay. So you make you make the ring. This is the the the, the way the individual does it. You hook around the ring. All right. So I want to find out the level of consciousness of this book. And. Um, I, of course, I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. First, I asked permission whether I could do this. Can I, can I test for the level of consciousness this book? Yes, I can test for it. All right. The first, so I start out with something very low, like is this book above 200? Yes. About 300? Yes. About 400? Yes. About 500? Yes. About 600? No, uh, so it's somewhere between 500 and 600, 550, 560, 570, 580, 585. So it's below 85. So it's 584, 585. So it's this book is at the level of 584. Does this make sense to you? This is how you use the muscle testing to use, to be able to use the scale <laughs> and find out what the level is. And of course you could do it with all kinds of things like I did that a little bit later. Um, so, um, and if I wanted to find the author of that book, what I, what I found out, <laughs> um, what I found out is the author is almost always at that same level or just a little bit above it. So I would say the, Joan Halifax, I have permission to, to test Joan Halifax. Yes. Here it is. Joan getting Halifax is at, eight, at, at 584. Yes. 585. Yes. 586. So Joan Halifax herself as the author is about one, one level out. If you don't know who she is, she's the uh, Buddhist uh, spiritual teacher out in New Mexico, I think, that has a huge following and is a Mm -hmm. an advanced soul, Joan Halifax. Yes, she's very much an advanced soul. Um, so, um, so you can you can teach uh, you can take you, you can test anything essentially. You can so um, uh, you can it's used quite universally for testing the level of consciousness of people, for example, the level of consciousness of animals, the level of consciousness of organizations, teachings, uh, philosophers, uh, you know, so forth. I use it a great deal for testing books. Um, I, I find it's very helpful for me to, I'm, I'm looking these, these days, I'm looking for books that are in the floor, the high 400s or the 500s. So I test these books before I buy them or, or get them. Uh, to help guide guide me to um, in my work. Um, okay, so we kind of demonstrated that. Maybe there'll be some questions on this later. But I want to get into what uh, John is putting up here. There's some there's some rules, kind of rules about it. I tried to. I was going to use the world rules, but it seemed harsh, so I said guides <laughs> guides to testing. Um, one of them is uh, it, you, you need to ask permission. Now, those seem strange, but essentially, I got to think about this. Who am I asking permission of? And essentially, I'm asking permission of, of God, of the whole world, the, the, and so on. And that's a, because this is kind of what, what you know, controls our, our muscles and so forth. You can, you can look at it a whole bunch of different ways. But you do, in fact, need to ask permission because, because sometimes the, 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 
that you get turned out. Um, and I, it's, you know, you're, you're not allowed to or not advised to uh, do that. So asking permission is, is, is an important factor in it. Um, the second part of it is, next one is, is you don't ask a question, you make a statement. You test a, a spoken statement. Is this, is this statement true? It's not whether you, you know, is, for example, uh, uh, can you say, uh, is my, uh, my name is Phil Meeks, yes. I couldn't test my, what is my name? You know, it just doesn't work. So you make, you're testing a statement. That's, that's part of the, the next one. These are some guidelines on how to do it. The other thing that Hawkins found is that people above, below 200 were not able to do this test. And as you saw from John's uh, uh, graph there, that 85% of the world's population are really not able to do this test because they are not integrous themselves. And so they, cannot, they can't use this test to do it. But um, so that's uh, so only about 15% of the world's population can actually do this test. And I'm sure that everybody, well, anyway, in the United States, that level is, is about 55% of the people in the United States are below 200. We're the highest in the world. We're, our level of consciousness is, is 422. The whole world's level of consciousness is about, uh, about 207. So the United States is the highest. And so in the United States, about 45% of the population can use the test, but 55% can't. Um, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm over doing this here. Um, there's, I just want to get another one in. A test, test it only works on reality, which means it only works on something that's in the present or the past. You can't test the future. So therefore you can't use it to pick horses or good stocks and so forth. <laughs> you, uh, you can only test something that's actually been real, something in the past, and it go back way back, um, as far as you want. And you also, the, the test is, is related to context. Um, and that's one of the reasons you have to ask permission because sometimes you make a statement and, and it's, it's the context that's, that's important about that statement. For example, if you, if you really wanted to find right. out what the level of consciousness was you know, for the author of the book at the time she wrote the author, then you'd have to ask, ask that specifically. If you offer, if you went to, uh, that would be the context of that. If you went to, what is the author? You'll get her, her general, her, her general uh, level of consciousness. I this is a lot. Up here just a bit, which is, I thought it was helpful for me when I would find an author that would, or somebody, he writes pretty clearly that some spiritual teachers then uh, regressed. Yes. yes. When they wrote their best works and were their most spiritual, they were quite, but then later on in their life, they had succumbed to some temptation from the ego and regressed. In that context, yet you can test for. Uh, and, and that was what I found useful, Phil, about right. that. That's a good point. Yeah, you, you know, you go up and down. On a, on a level of consciousness as you go through life. Generally, hopefully you're going up most of the time, but as John says, you can degress de as well. I, I just, um, in summary, I'd kind of like to make a statement that, um, that this is a serious thing. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very reliable. If you work at it, you, I, I take it, very seriously, I, I get myself centered when I'm doing this, and um, uh, and I have a lot of confidence in it. If you don't, if you you know, and which is you you know, if you don't believe this and so forth, forget it. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> um, 
most people that study Hawkins in our my little group that we uh, we're talking about later, most most of people do not do any testing at all. They're they're there for what is kind of the second half of what we're talking about, which is the spiritual side and all the wisdom that Hawkins has from a psychological and spiritual standpoint in his own life and so forth. So don't get hung up on the testing. Um, I think this is an important thing. But we wanted to, John and I wanted to give you some idea what it is so that you get you get the what his foundation is, what this what this uh, level of consciousness is all about, because it is a very very valuable tool if you if you uh, if you buy into it, uh, you have, and you do enough work to find out that it's it's uh, um, you know you, uh, it's it's it's, it's you get to gain the confidence in it and so forth. Yeah. So uh, we're. Yeah, good, good concluding comments, Phil. And uh, yeah, please, we've been at this now for about an hour, so let's take some questions on this. I want, I want you to know that. Um, All right. Let uh, me let me do one more thing. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Then we'll do the questions. Okay, sorry, because this is fun. <laughs> I want to, I want to uh, evaluate the level of consciousness of this group, the whole group, and that's possible. You can, you can level of consciousness of everything. So this is not the individuals, this is kind of it was kind of more or less the average. But you can get the level of consciousness of this whole group. And so I'm gonna do that right now. Okay. Okay. This group is above 200. Yes. Above 300. Yes. Above 400. Yes. About 500. Okay. Somewhere below in the 400. This group is a 450, 460, 470, 480, 490, 495, 491, 492, 490, 492. This group is at 492. This is very, very high. The um, the average, say, uh, in the United States, the United States is 422. So you can see. You're a select group, <laughs> and I'm not surprised. <laughs> and that also means that there's quite a few people in this group that are above 500, or you wouldn't have that power to bring you up there. So be proud of that. You're a high, you're you're a real great group. Loving group here. There you go, Jim. <laughs> and, and I, I, Phil didn't want to let you know this, but I know who's pulling us down the most. But I won't. I won't reveal that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so you want to get the questions or yeah we're about halfway through now and, and thanks for letting us uh, run through this material the second half will be quite different in terms of the more non-dual approach and less the scale of consciousness but the reason we spent time on it is he puts it in every book he puts it up front you, you and it, there were times when i wished carl jung wouldn't have spent so much time on um on alchemy, you know, I thought, oh shoot, why did he spend so much? Then I finally understood what he saw in alchemy. And so I dropped my modern rationalistic put down of why Jung would spend, waste some time on this strange thing. Well, I'd say the same thing for me with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, that's, that's analogous at least to this. Sometimes they wish you wouldn't spend so much time with it because there's so much power in the other, but he puts it in front of you. You cannot ignore it. You have to take it on. So here comes some questions. Thank you. Um, Thomas says, is there one book that would cover your discussion today? By the way, Zoom is wonderful as this is. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I didn't see all the whole question, but I would say, which book would you recommend, Phil, uh, Power Versus Force or? Yeah, I would definitely recommend starting with po uh, Power Versus Force. Um, I got these and uh, yeah, this is the Power Versus this this is this is his introductory book, and I, I recommend doing that. And then he's actually it's a number of the, 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 the books he wrote in, in chronological order. The next one would be Eye of the Eye, and what this does is is kind of a uh, yeah 
you know, they all have this they all have this uh, scale of consciousness in it like Jen was saying um, and the eye of the eye he's he's talking more about in the 500s through the in the getting into in through the 600s in that eye of the eye the next book he wrote is I don't have the dust cover on this but it's I I just I I and these are the first three books he wrote and I recommend they you read them in that order this is this kind of goes from from the level of around the 600s on up and uh, I, i'm going to say a comment about that phil which is when i when i read the eye i said who has anything to write about that you know and sure enough i found it interesting and not interesting but vital he talked about uh, right. after you get enlightened what do you do i said are you kidding me <laughs> Why would anybody? How can anybody write about that? And it actually, I found it valuable. So, it's uh, very valuable, even though we're not there. It's it's good to know what you know could happen. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't want to. I, I I'm revealing my. I, I'm a six twenty right now, but I didn't want to tell you that. But I better <laughs> excuse me for being silly here. This is so. What other questions do we have? What other questions? Thank you for that great question. Whoever asked that. Uh, but you can see what Phil's talking about here. There's a sequence of books, and that's what Phil had me do. Power versus Four. Letting Go. You could always read Letting Go in there, The Path of Surrender. Then you can read Eye of the Eye and I. But it's nicely listed in his books. They always say, here's his books. Which one is that, Phil? Yeah, I think, yeah it, there's two books that um, don't talk about uh, muscle testing at all. <laughs> um, they're just really great books on the psychological, spiritual, looking at um, the process of letting go, wonderful book. And this book is called Healing and Recovery. And this again is, is has, doesn't, doesn't come, it doesn't uh, even mention practically uh, muscle testing. It's just full of great wisdom. So these are great books. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. We, got a, we got a nice comment there that said, uh, before Virginia's came up saying, emotional issues are really good to test. Thank you for that comment. Uh, if you want to turn on your mic, you can do it that way too and give us, uh, there's Virginia's question, needing to be over 200 tests. Could a person over 200 test someone who is under 200? What's, what's that again? Uh, Virginia asks, could a person over 200 test someone who is under 200? A person over 200 can definitely test somebody that's under 200, yes. They can find out what the level of that consciousness. They can find a, a person uh, that test applies to anybody that's over two hundred. They can they can determine any question they ask. So yes, they they can determine the person that's under two hundred. Another another person is that is that what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. Yep. And, okay. And Mary Meeks has a question. I think you know that person, Phil. Yes, I know her well. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. So Mary's question. Mary Lee. <laughs> here's Mary's question. Will my level of consciousness increase as I follow my spiritual journey? Good question, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that's that's kind of what's that's kind of what it's all about. Um, uh, when you're you know you're we're we're working on trying to improve our it's like this is why we're here. This is uh, this got kind of wrapped up with karma too. This is yeah. why we're here is to work on our levels of consciousness until we become enlightened. So yes, they're very related, and completely next, related. Right? Next question: How do we know the, the the strength of the answers are from God? I'll take that one, uh, Richard. Um, um, the rational mind would say we don't know. We don't know. So let the rational mind say we don't know but if you let your heart say is there a field of consciousness around us uh and if that field of consciousness is the ground of being that's the zen way of saying it the ground of being then is there an energy level that will show up and and what phil's purporting here and i would agree with him is if your heart's in the right place if you're not ego attached around it uh that's why you get God, I, I, so you could say God is part of this, or not part of this, God, but, but if you need other language for it, um, and that, so I would say that's the best answer I know on that question. 
Um, See, uh, when Phil states that the U.S. is above all our countries, this doesn't sound plausible. Can he explain this statement? Yeah, question about why would the U.S. get higher scores? Why would the U.S.? Yeah, that's a. I think that's a Kath, Kathleen yeah, Fowler. Good question. Um, well, uh, <laughs> up until recently, <laughs> I think we might all agree, but those, over the last four years, I'm not sure we would. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> um, but it is it is uh, it is a fact that uh, in his testing that he, he tested all the countries. The, the country closest to this interesting is Singapore, and uh, the Middle Eastern countries almost all are at the level of two hundred or, or, or level less than two hundred. So he, he's got a whole chart of. Uh, by the way, he. He had, a, a, he had an institution that studied this whole thing. So it's not just his testing and so on, but it was a, a testing of, of you know, hundreds of people, I suppose. I don't know. Um, but uh, yes, the, you could put the, all the countries of the, the world on the scale, and the United States would come out the top. Singapore would be very much closer to it, a little, little bit lower, and so forth. European yeah, Kathleen, what I would add to that is uh, um, that is the kind of thing that I think, hmm, do I need to know that? Do I need to know that my country, because it can lead to that, I, you know what the ego will do with that. Oh, then the United States should be dictating to the rest of the world what they should be doing. And then after the humili, after the, like January 6th, the humiliation of that in our country, do we have a right to go out and tell other democracies how to run their life? You know, so. So, and I think Hawkins scale will, um, uh, it can jar our liberal sensitivities and our humanity, it can jar it because he'll come up with a number and a statement like that. So that's the part that I would say, uh, you know, if you have trouble with that, you can do the other parts of him. I do think that America has a unique place in the world. We're the country that's the experiment for democracy with all the pluralism, right? All the racial, and ethnic and religious. Uh, and so we still could be a beacon for hope, like that Statue of Liberty, you know, we, 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 we've got to get, we've got to get through our challenges uh, so that we can be, a, a, if we can make it with our pluralism as a democracy, then the world has a better chance of doing it. No one's taking it on like we are because they don't have the huge amount of diversity that we have. So maybe that's our opportunity uh, Kathleen, I get your question, um, and uh, uh, it's it's a deep one. It's it's a deep question uh, of, with all kinds of implications. Um, see, let's go to a couple more questions here. Can Thank I ask a question verbally? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. You know, a long time ago, a friend of mine gave me a little book that had to do with um, using a a pendulum, and the idea is you. Um, Suspend something like a ring, for example, at the end of a at the end of a cord, and you. I I haven't done this for a long time, but the idea is like you say something like you know, show what yes is, and you this. The idea is like you know just. the ring and the pendulum, it just sort of responds. And then you can ask um, a question like, you know, should I attend this webinar, something like that? And you get, you know, yes and no. And, you know, the idea is that it doesn't, um, how should I say the, the, the source of the information is, mysterious so well, i wonder does, does, go ahead. Go ahead. Does, does that have anything to do with this muscle testing it's the same the same sort of thing i'd like to ask mary who knows more about pendulums than anybody i know if, if she would you respond to this uh, mary 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 lee i'm just unmuting hi yeah i guess um i would say it's a similar principle and probably another way something could be done. And it seems like the question framed in 
you know, what is the highest good? Is this, this is for the highest good of all concerned as a statement or, and you can find out that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, pendulum reading is, I think, a similar principle. I think even, I'm, Hawkins even mentions that, that there's other methods similar like that. Yeah, I, I think so too, Hi, Mary. Thanks for adding that. Yeah. The, uh, Jim, the, uh, when I was in my 20s, so back in the rock and roll 60s and then led to the 70s, the new age was upon us. And that's the first time I found uh, energy work being demonstrated that way. So I'd put a, a piece of metal on a end of a string. I'd go over to a bowl of rice, brown rice, and it would go one direction that you'd get a little uh -huh. spiral in, a, in a direction. You'd go over to a bowl of sugar, you'd get a spiral in the other direction. Right. And that would be yin and yang, for instance, yin and yang, expansive or contractive energy. So when I was in my 20s, I got opened up to this and probably a lot of us did. I went to a food allergist once and she was doing kinesiology. You know, that was probably when I was in my 30s. So it's been around, there's many, many ways of doing this. Uh, you know, ley lines are well known on the planet, energy lines on the planet. You can get astro cartography done for you with a good astrologist. You can find out where, where you should, where the good energy is for your, you know, somewhere. So it's a, it's a wide open, uh, poss set of possibilities around what what are the patterns of the universe that we in our rationalist empirical uh, minds cannot find and uh, you know but that opens up and, and you by the way Jung was all there Jung was very much into astrology very much into alchemy wow. and uh, the nonlinear that's where the nonlinear is it's in these mm -hmm. places that aren't normally uh, seen mm -hmm. as uh, um, yeah when I was I uh, was a graduate of the Barbara Brennan School uh, many years ago, and we used pendulums regularly to test out uh, chakras and energy that was, you know, how the energy was flowing and that kind of thing. Yeah, got a comment from David. Sounds like Ouija boards. Yeah, you have to be careful. But he really warned Hawkins is really yeah. warns us all against the the occult. He says, watch out. He said, don't play with that because you can get toxically impacted and uh and you'll you'll even think oh i'm not impacted by this stuff and instead mm -hmm. it's quite impactful right so i'm going to move on now to some other thoughts on the devotional side if that's all right thanks for all those questions everybody phil you think you're ready to move on here yeah, yeah i'm ready all right. all right so let's do some more and there's uh these are, these are things that stick with us from um, the many books that we've read. Uh, I'll take a couple of these. Phil can take, can take as, what he wants as well. But he does a wonderful job for me of describing aware mind versus thinking mind. And from, if, in my way of thinking, I always thought the ego was about selfishness, self-interest. And that's really true. You know, the ego is about self-interest and survival and all that. I did not realize until I read Hawkins, it's a lot about habit. It's just flat out habituated thinking patterns where you always think you have to have a comment and an editorial thought about something. And he, he recommends shut down the, <laughs> the constant positionality, and he called position, and he would say that the, uh, just bypass the mind as best you can. That is so hard. We are so used to commenting, editorializing those internal conversations. And he says, go to aware mind, go to aware mind, go to take a breath. And of course, that's the mindfulness piece. So witnessing and observing yourself, witnessing is the stance to be in to bypass this. It's, it's easier said than done. What, what goes with that, of course, is ride the wave of now, ride the crest of this moment. So all the mindfulness work is a great way. And he's, he's a huge proponent of... Uh, of getting into the now and staying there so that uh, you, you can get out of your thoughts, your thought streams, which are endless. As, as Jim Hollis would tell us all, James Hollis, our great teacher here at Colum in Columbus, uh, there's a lot of traffic up there, a lot of traffic. <laughs> and he says, that's that traffic that you've got to uh, be careful with. So I'll just go with that. He uses a phrase I love, which is radically subjective be radically subjective. And I thought, oh boy, for an empirical world, for a rational world, that is such a strong, wonderful counterpoint. So we leave the content of the mind and we seek the context. 
we become the audience or the observer of our own life. And uh, what's important about this, I'll just use that political example. If we're gonna use a political example, the reason anything can get politicized right now in our culture is because our political context is so unhealthy. When context is poisonous and toxic, you can bring any content and instantly polarize it and away we go. And you can make an industry out of that and we have. But we do it with ourselves as well. We have all these inner arguments and polarities. And uh, he would say, for instance, hot and cold are not a polarity. There's something called temperature. And it's either a lot, you know, high temperature or low temperature, but it's, it's on the same scale. So he, he does a wonderful job of convincing you that a lot of these things that seem like polarities that you have to take a position on, the position itself is not important. Matter of fact, it's just an old habit that you think you have to take a position shut that uh, shut that ego positionality uh, habit down. And is that hard to do, but is it worth it? And he has a beautiful phrase about, I might come across this later. Um, the ego is primordial, it's primordial, it is not sovereign. And I loved that phrase for me, it is primordial, the ego is there, but it is not sovereign. And if you work at dissolving it enough, um, non-attachment versus detachment. It's not about withdrawing from life. It's about not getting attached to results. So just, he, he uses those phrases like, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about karma and karmic propensities. He, if, if, you, if you get into his world, he says the Western mind has a hard time with karma. Too bad Westerners, because so much of the, of the spiritual world is well attuned to karmic notions. And uh, he would also, he, he, he's not a, he, he kind of likes past life regression. He says, if you want to do past life regression work, there's good work there. So you can tell he's a proponent of reincarnation. Um, but um, so I just put that out there for you. So uh, I've never been too much into those concepts, but it, they make sense to me when I, when I read him. And he would say things like this, that potential, see the, the, I guess it's a six bullet there, potentiality to actuality. That's the emergence of the non-linear. That's the emergence of life. He would, he's not a big cause and effect guy. He says, that's great for $4.99 and below. Cause and effect, empiricism, rational, hooray intellect, uh, hooray science for working in the domains that you belong. Work in the domain, but don't expect yourself to be able to then apply non-linear thinking uh, or linear thinking to non-linear concepts like kinesiology. You know, that's one of the things that would be nonlinear that may be found out by science someday, but it's not known yet. So he would say, uh, he would say potentiality becomes actuality when there's this emergence that happens when you have good, when you have, when the karmic propensities allow plus intention plus positive conditions. So that's, he, he mentions that a lot in his writings is, and that's why you see the word intention, intention, he would say our intention is crucial. And, and that's why you can't ask questions about the future because it's undetermined yet. And we have to, on this plane, figure out where our intentions are leaving us. I've spoken a lot here. Phil, do you want to add anything to my little rap here about what's going on? No, I, I, I'm sorry, John. I'm getting the, the feeling that we're covering a lot of stuff that, um, that uh, Hawkins actually covers a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely he does. Because he, uh, he, he works us into it. I, I think we're, we're throwing ideas out, concepts out and so forth that, that might kind of shake everybody up. But um, if you read Hawkins, <laughs> you'll find out that he he actually teaches you. He brings he brings you into these concepts and be, and and the concepts are beginning to you know make sense. Um, yeah, but well, that, goes, that doesn't take away from you and me at all. We're just trying to do our best. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm just I'm just trying to give you some more levers to <laughs> levers to see if some of these phrases. Uh, see if some of these phrases are attractive to you or, or jar you. It's a good, it's a good point because uh, radically subjective. When I read that the first time, I had to think about that a lot. Uh, and so these terms, if they don't feel uh, particularly natural, uh, I, we're giving you a lot of the other stuff now that's way out of the levels of consciousness, but part of it. 
let me make this comment about Jung and then see if you have any uh, questions uh, at, at the end here. I don't think there's another one after this. Yeah, there it is. So Hawkins and Jung both go into synchronicity and the A-causal, the A-causal, which was uh, Jung's term for synchronicity. And, he, and they use the word emergence a lot. <clears throat> um, I guess I shouldn't say they, I would say uh, Hawkins uses the word emergence a lot. If you know the word, the word emergence, at least in part, it comes from systems theory. This would be John Schuster talking about another field of not, but the systems theory people say, if you watch evolution, the, the components of a system that are there would not be enough to predict what the next level of consciousness or the next evolutionary step was. They call that emergence, when that which emerges out of that which came before was not predictably available because it just pops out. And so that's a causal. That's the notion of emergence. That, of course, chaos theory and complexity theory and quantum physics helps us here. And, and he gets into quantum physics in a good way. So that's us. That's me talking about phrases and ideas that stick with us. And I'm trying to give you a, a little crash course in things that may, you may or may not find interesting. There's the wave. There's the wave of now. Isn't that a beautiful image? And he would say, if you're on the back of the wave, you're thinking about the past. If you're on the front of the wave, you're futuring out. Get on the crest. Get on that knife edge of the moment. What questions or comments do we have after that little blast of content from yours truly? And thank you for your comment, Phil, about maybe or maybe not that may have been no helpful, what not helpful whatsoever. So comments or questions on any of that? Anybody? Um, I just was thinking about um, the concept which you, you guys covered, but he really stresses in the book that transition at the level of 200 as the level of basic, uh, basic honesty, integrity, and um, that there's a whole shift in consciousness at that point. That's kind of like you know water going from freezing to melting, you know. Um, and when he shows that scale about how many people are above 200, it would look like the balance of consciousness would be in sort of in the the lacking honesty and integrity, but it's because of the increasing power, like you're talking about the logarithmic effect that a few people at a very high level of consciousness can balance out, you know, many people who uh, level of consciousness is, at, is lower. So it's just, that seemed like a major. Um, Good concept. <laughs> yeah, thanks Mary. Thanks Mary, yeah. Thomas uh, has a question about emergence, so you sure you have it. Well, um, emergence is one of the modern terms that has come up that, that if from the sciences, as I know them, the science of systems, that is one that uh, Hawkins uses in a, in a different way. But he would say creativity or creation is evolution. Evolution is creation. <laughs> And that if we look at evolution, we would say it's all cause and effect. But the people who look at evolution say, well, where did these evolutionary jumps come from? How did that come from that? How did that? And there's not necessarily a, a, a empirical way of saying that because this, the components of the system that were in the system at one level did not predict the, the, high, the next highest level. So that's a notion of emergence. So I hope that helps a little bit. Other questions or comments? Other questions? Go ahead and, and, uh, and comments are fine too. Love the concept of the wave. Yeah, I love the, the beautiful wave concept as well. Yeah, uh, there's a quote in there, Hawkins reminds me of Maslow's farther reaches of human nature. No question. Maslow was on it. Maslow was probably, who knows where he was conscious wise, but Maslow saw that consciousness is heading towards this. Teilhard de Chardin, those of you who are Chardinians are like Teilhard de Chardin. He saw the, the evolution going from, he would always say metamorphosis, metamorphosis, and that was his way of saying, he'd look at Archaeology, he'd see stones and he'd see this constantly progressing level of consciousness in the fossils of the world. He was a paleontologist and he said, Well, where is this heading? And he said, It's headed towards an omega point. And of course, that would be so what, so what Hawkins is about. Other questions or comments on any of those phrases? I'll put them back up here just briefly. And we'll, we have more to say here. We'd love to hear some additional info regarding how you move from atheism to enlightenment. Uh, Kathy, that's a great story, Kathy. Um, 
he uh, he was cr raised Christian, somewhat Christian. This is Hawkins' bi biology here. I mean, uh, bi biography. My understanding was he was raised Christian. And he writes, that, by the way, in the back of his book, there's often a four or five page uh, summary of his book about uh, uh, his, his life, because he wants people to know what his story is. And so he came up through Christianity. Then he went into the science mode. Obviously, he was very scientific and psych psychiatric. Uh, he hit a despair point. And he was meditating a huge amount, and he was doing, and he hit a, a place of deep despair. And he, when, when he went to the despair point, he became atheist because of the suffering in the world. And he said, God can't exist if that's the case. When he hit a true hellish place in his life, he, he asked for uh, help. He said, If there is a God, help me now, or something that poignant. And bam, uh, that's when it hit. So that's part of his journey from there's much more behind it, but when he hit a point of total despair, which is often the case with humanity, is it not? Uh, look at Paul, uh, you know, uh, the apostle Paul, you know, out persecuting, persecuting the Christians as a, as a uh, Greek born Jew, I think he was, but at any rate, uh, and then he becomes the number one spreader of Christianity, you know, so boink, it happened. And uh, that's, he, he writes about it quite powerfully. Uh, in his in his books um let's keep going then we've got more to say are we okay here how's everybody doing everybody okay all right i'm taking that silence as wonderful yes so there's that beautiful wave of the wave of now let's let's actually this has been quite intellectual and quite demanding shall we all take a breath right now if you want to stand up and take do that too but let's do either a stretch or a deep breath and get a little centered. Bring our energies back in to our hearts. Take another breath. Our hands over our heart chakras is always a good place to go. Great. All right. Thank you for that. And at least uh, in part, I know what Phil was reacting to as I was going blah, 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 is that's my rational cognitive John showing up trying to use words and do all that stuff. There is a deeper truth here behind all this that we can, uh, we can find. And I've already found a deeper place in myself to speak from by doing that. So thank you, Phil, for that. Uh, Phil, do you want to say something about one of these quotes from? Oh, this is uh, yeah, this is a little uh, uh, synchronicity. <laughs> I uh, read a um, daily uh, reading of Hawkins, just a, uh, a simple a quote from Hawkins. And uh, the day that John and I were working on putting these uh, slides together and so forth, I got this quote in my daily reading, and I thought it was right on target. <laughs> Human progress is evolutionary, and therefore mistakes and errors are inevitable. The only real tragedy is to become older and not wiser. <laughs> Being older, I'm working on becoming wiser. <laughs> anyway, this hit me. <laughs> I, I, th I threw it out as a joke. <laughs> well, those of us who know Phil, uh, you're, you're a great model of aging for all of us, Phil. and. We love you for that. We love you for that. Thank you. Thank you for being that. There's thousands of quotes from uh, from him. This is uh, this is one. I'll let you read that. Go ahead and read this one if you'd like. This is an example of the scientific side of him that will pop into any paragraph he feels like as he's deepening and developing a thought. Yeah. Here's that positionality problem. All opinions are vanities with no intrinsic value.
And you could look at our media right now and say that's why it is so toxic right now in our culture because commentate, commentating and uh, commenting and editorial opinions are so highly valued and get us nowhere spiritually. So here's, we started with his quote about ego. We thought we'd come back to ego um, again before we leave his comments. We have several more minutes here, but the, the ego is not the enemy, but it does need to be ignored, weakened, and, and dissolved. So most of us learn this when you were younger, you might say, oh, I'm going to get rid of my ego, and you, you do battle with it, and that doesn't get us very far. And so that that graphic there is a maze. And if that looks like monkey mind, it's supposed to. So if you ever found your thoughts going in circles and blind, you know, so that's the monkey mind of the ego consciousness. Endless positionalities like our current media. And as I said before, it's not self-interest always, <clears throat> though gain and loss, attraction, aversion is always in the mix with the ego. It's always in the mix. And so, it, but it's more about habituation and endless looping tracks. It's the monkey mind that you want to slow, slow down and not let it be in charge anymore. And uh, I found this thought particularly powerful from, uh, from Hawkins, which is where does this ego come from? And he says, plant, the plant world has the capability of uh, you know, generating its own food, its own energy source. The animal world had to find food from the outside and bring it in. And so the hunter, the hunter uh, gatherer part of humanity was that early form that was always taking from the outside, taking nourishment in. It didn't take too long once we got more sophisticated, more into urban areas and stratified, got out of tribes and in groups and into cities with specialized uh, roles that, uh, that the ego then became uh, uh, applied to all these other social forms of wealth. We, we accumulate wealth, we accumulate power, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? And so um, that's the temptations from the ego, but he would say the ego is innocent it's a natural part of who we are. And mainly we're just ignorant and uninformed. And he has a very innocent view of, or of, of a huge view of self-forgiveness and innocence is really the place we should be coming from. And reestablishing that innocence is part of what we're trying to do. So enough on the ego from John. Anything you wanna add there, Phil, about ego as you know it? Uh. No, I don't think so. Good. Yeah. All right. All right. I want to put out uh, what, one of the things he does in this book called Transcending the Levels of Consciousness. He, he reminds us that after all this intellectualizing about spirituality and the phrases of radical subjectivity or karmic propensity or the things that make our rational minds feel uh, more sophisticated in terms of what we what we acquire, he would say, it's not about acquisition of the mind. A simple spiritual practice is more powerful than a lot of books. And if you, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was starting my union master's degree and I was acquiring a lot of knowledge and I'm not saying that was wasted time by any means, but if I don't work on myself spiritually while I'm acquiring knowledge about, remember it's heard about, know about, to uh, learn to do to be, he said, you're wasting your time. And here's an example. He gives us examples in the back of his book of 10 simple practices that are better, uh, that, that are the kind of things you want to use that are of great value. Revere all of life in all its expressions, no matter what, excuse the typo there, even if one does not understand it. Presume no actual reliable knowledge of anything at all. Ask God to reveal its meaning. It tend to see the hidden beauty of all that exists. It then reveals itself. See how simple and spiritually oriented these are? So that's what I love about, about this. 
Number four, forgive everything that is witnessed and experienced no matter what. Remember, Christ, Buddha, and Krishna all said that error is due to ignorance. Socrates said, all men can choose only what they believe to be good. Be kind to everything and everyone, including oneself, all the time, with no exception. See, these are practices of the heart. I'll let you read these to yourself in silence. I particularly like number eight when he said, make your life a prayer. And he says that multiple times. I thought, oh, what a beautiful way of saying what the sacred path is about. Here's what Phil spent all that time on with confirm the level of consciousness. So you can see the hopefulness that, uh, and the, uh, the positiveness of, of what he's about with his notion that this evolution of consciousness is within our grasp and we can really make progress here. Um, spiritual declaration, what a great phrase. Any, uh, any comments or observations about these 10 simple truths, anybody? Simple tools, I should say. Um, I'm just thinking that uh, we rightly so emphasize the importance of getting beyond the ego. Um, psychology and so forth is really about strengthening the ego, which is which is right at that level of consciousness. But as you progress above the level 400 and the 500s and so forth, there's a necessity to get be get beyond the ego into what Jung called was the self um, and, uh, and Hawkins called uh, essentially the self or the higher self or, uh, and uh, kind of living in that, and living at that level, living at that dimension. And it, it's just a, it's just a different place. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm kind of running out of words here, but uh, it's it's um, uh, it's a place of bliss for one thing, uh, happiness, and uh, uh, kind of giving some of this this ego stuff behind us. The ego's not a bad thing at all. It's it's a good thing, and it gets us it gets us where we are. But to progress. Spiritually, you need to really be, begin to get beyond the ego, um, and uh, and for people who are into psychology, this is uh, kind of blows your mind. <laughs> but uh, if you want to move from psychology to spirituality and so forth, uh, I think you have to take that into strong consideration. So. Thank you. Thank this, you. Is off, this is off the cuff and I didn't intend to say this, but it seems appropriate. <laughs> yes. John, if I could say, this is hey, Belinda. Belinda. Hey, Belinda. Um, a, a metaphor I really like is that the, my ego is a necessary developmental step. Yeah. And it's like crawling. So when I'm a baby and I learn to crawl, that's wonderful. And I become mobile, but then I learn to walk and I leave the crawling behind. And it's not that I can't crawl anymore, but that walking is so much better. And so the ego is crawling and the movement into higher self or true nature is being able to walk and um, how much more that offers for us. 
in Thank our you, lives. Thank you, Linda. That was terrific. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> I'm loving hearing you talk about this, though. It's great. Thank you. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> my, my engineering mind gets in the way here a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a good mind. It's a holy, holy engineering. You're, 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 you're giving us the path of holy engineering. Holy um, engineering, I love that. <laughs> uh, David makes a comment there about involvement in the world takes an ego, and it does. Uh, I've, I do, I'm doing a lot of work on this depolarizing front. I've told several of you about all the work that's happening in depolarizing, and I have to get in there with my, you know, use my ego, as Belinda talked about. I'm glad to crawl when I need to, <laughs> um, and all of us have a, and, and he would say, uh, you know, he would say, give thanks. Uh, uh, Hawkins says, give, give thanks to your ego. It got you this far. Way to go. Pat it on the back. And he treats it, uh, he treats it like a nice little teddy bear. He says, be loving towards it. <laughs> Just don't let it be in charge. <laughs> I haven't seen this yet, but Phil says in some of his presentations that are on video, he has a teddy bear with him up there on the... <laughs> yeah, it's fixed the teddy bear. It's legal. Legal. <laughs> well, let me make a few more comments then, and then we'll do our final questions. Uh, any other final? Any other questions from anybody before I do our final sc 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 uh, screen share here? We good? Uh, so we're going to say a few more things about what this means to us and send you off with a few kind of ideas of what Hawkins recommends and that kind of thing. So Hawkins is big into A Course in Miracles and some of you have probably done that. And so I started it about 120 days ago and it's radically in line with what he says. Uh, and so I would, uh, if you haven't done that program, it's not for everybody, but I'm liking it. He, uh, I'm not showing you the book here, but he recommends a book by these are Gardada Maharaj, you know him, uh, and, he, and uh, uh, he, I Am That is the book that I got out of the library uh, by, Mar by Nizar Gardada. He's a 20th century uh, Indian, um, Indian mystic, uh, and Muktananda, of course, there's many others, there's lots of non-dual teachers out there. A book that he, he recommends from 1698, those of you with the Christian persuasion, like I I have a Christian persuasion in me. This is called The Practice of the Presence of God, Conversations with Brother Lawrence. And it's this little book that apparently was used in the Catholic seminary. It still is used in Catholic seminaries. It's 40 pages long. It's beautiful. It's just this, this one humble little, he's not like Meister Eckhart or some big spiritually well-known dude. He's just this humble little dude who practiced all the time, quieting his mind and devoting himself to God. It was it's just a beautiful little uh, little book that I found very inspiring. Mm -hmm. So uh, the title of the book is uh, uh, This Practice of the Presence of God. It's right there on the third line down. And Nizar Garadada writes a book called I Am That. It's a number of recorded uh, presentations. And Phil can tell you many more. He and Mary have read a lot of spiritual books together, and I couldn't begin to meet uh, what he's done with it. Bhagavad Gita, he likes the ancients. The New Testament, he thinks the New Testament is great. Psalms and Proverbs test very high. They test very... Revelations, not so much. And he would say some, uh, some translations of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, can be way under 200. <laughs> so he would, he would say, be selective with, with the Bible. And he has a Lamsa. I don't know the Lamsa... Uh, translation, some translation he likes of the Bible that he thinks is the best. Uh, he's a big Jesus Christ and Buddha and Zor Zoroaster or Zarathustra, the one Nietzsche talked about. He's a Krishna fan, <laughs> fan as the, you know, he basically says these are the great avatars. And he, so he's very multi multiple religious friendly in his, in his thing. So these are the kind of things he recommends and you'll see him recommending that in his books. Um, Few more quotes that Phil want like so much, and I think these are great. You can go ahead and read those. You want to read those, Phil, to us? Okay. We change the world not by what we say or do, 
but it's a consequence of what we have become. That's the ending of what uh, John was talking about, about knowing and finally being that, that person. Love is misunderstood to be an emotion. Actually, it is a state of awareness, a way of being in the world, a way of seeing oneself and others. It's essentially everything <laughs> in, a, in a state of love. Uh, it becomes a way of life. And when a, I... A wonderful way. <laughs> uh, when I read his books, I find many a powerful phrase and sentence and paragraphs. And page. There's many, many things I take from him. So, Phil, you want to take people oh, through yeah, this? this is, uh, I, uh, there is a, a local study group that I've been in for, I don't know, many years. And uh, uh, so the, the lower part is about that group. The, the, the first part here is if you were looking for groups anywhere in the country, uh, you could go to their, the publisher here uh, at this site and find that. I, uh, I put, let's <laughs> see, wait, wait, we'll go back. <laughs> I'll, I'll go back to it, Phil. Uh, okay. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this also in the. Uh, sorry about that. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put this in the uh, chat so people can have all this too. Oh good. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. No, I haven't found it yet. Yep. Yeah, it, it'll be it'll be back in a second. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm gonna get this whole thing copied. You want to talk about the study group a little bit? Well, what? You want to talk about the study group a little bit? Oh yeah, a study group. Uh, the lower part of that is in a study group that uh, been running for years, uh, probably fifteen or twenty years, and um, and I got this information on there. It's, it's 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 originated and sponsored by the Phoenix Bookstore in uh, Clintonville uh, on, on Main Street. Uh, Bob Peters is the owner of that store, and uh, may, may, many of you may know him. Um, anyway, uh, there, you know, here it is. Good. Um, so, it, it's, it, let's, while we're on that, can you raise that a little bit? Let's see, wait, see. Okay. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm talking about our local study group. That's in the Phoenix Bookstore. And this is the information that it. Bob Peters is the owner and the facilitator of it is, is Nancy, who is on, I haven't seen her picture, but she's, I saw her name here. Um, and she facilitates And what we do in that is we read his, his books um, slowly and discuss them and there's a lot, and the best part I think is the is the discussions, and uh, it's a good group, and it meets uh, Monday uh, at seven to eight, um, but it's meeting on Zoom now. Is you got that? John, yeah, just, uh, I have it down there at the bottom, and I also put it in the chat, everybody. Meeting room. Okay, yeah. Um, there's no charge, of course, on it, and it's on Zoom. So the meeting. This is the meeting ID and. And the, uh, uh, the ID or whatever, uh, password. <laughs> That's the password. So this is this is the uh, the local group. And uh, if you want to, um, I've got my own name up there. Uh, if you want to ask some questions on email, I'd love to. I'd love to to do it. Um, I've got lots more time than John. John's got a job. <laughs> he has a, John has a real world. <laughs> and uh, I'm sitting here studying <laughs> and right. meditating. So there's Phil's email, the third line down. And, and uh, you want to talk to the person who's been studying this for a lot more years than I have anyway. So right. good. So there's our local, there's the, the a local loot. And then there's a, 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 a you can get groups any place. Right. In the world, in the, in the world, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's Monday night. Here's a. Um, 
Here, here's a little bit about what I would say about the uh, um, what to expect if you read him, and this may be kind of my this is my take on on uh, on Hawkins from other points of view and what's different about him. Uh, there's a wide range of his writing style that's that's here, and uh, uh, so um, there's something for everyone, but it's a very direct style. Like I said earlier, Jungians are kind of used to reading archetypal, image-rich, narrative bait, lots of story, you know, all these things that we get into, all of which is good, by the way. But his style is much more direct. It's not engineering-like, and his, 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 his phrases can be very uh, uh, powerful and beautiful. So there's not, it, there is a little, there, there's some poetry in his writing as well, I find, uh, like radically subjective and these terms that I really like coming out of him. At the same time, though, expected directness. And then this is a range of things. That it's, there's some Dale Carnegie in him, some positive thinking. There's quantum physics in him. There's neuroscience in him. Uh, there's a kind of current coaching research in him, what I would call current coaching research. There's depth psychology, uh, positive psychology, many beautiful passages. So just expect a lot of different things to come up uh, as, you, as you read him. And uh, that's how I would say if, if, but many of you have probably been reading him for quite some time anyway, so you would have a different way of saying that. Does anybody else have a way you would describe Hawkins to you, what he's meant to you or what his writing style is or anything like that before we go to our last, we're going to a Q and A section now, uh, Q and Q and R. No answers here, only responses. Anybody else have a way of describing um, Hawkins to you? So Rich, Rich, I'm gonna call on you. You've read a lot of his books. Uh, Rich Bates, how would you describe what Hawkins, uh, his style or his approach for you? Yeah, and I, I thank Phil for introducing me to Hawkins uh, some years ago, and I have read many of his books. Uh, Phil has a great uh, video collection, uh, which has also been very instructive for me. But, um, you know, Hawkins ranges widely over the whole wisdom tradition of human history, psychological, spiritual, uh, religious. And I think you guys have done a great job uh, condensing uh, his, his thinking. And uh, I really appreciate the, the 10 truths, John, that you put up there on the screen there toward the end, which really summarizes uh, his, great, uh, his great insights. But he is well worth studying. He's well worth uh, uh, getting deeply into. He's rich. He's rich, says rich. <laughs> Would it be possible for you to uh, send out those 10 truths? Happy to do that, sure. Everyone? Uh, well, how do I do that? Uh, do I? Uh, you, you want them posted to the website? You, yeah. want your, you want your PowerPoint presentation posted to the website? Yeah, we can do that for sure. That's how we can do it. Yeah. yeah Does that sure. work for you? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. I really like them. Any website? Good. Any other questions, observations for anybody? I just was thinking that uh, I got introduced to Hawkins. I went to this lecture on physics in the modern age, and then this person ended up talking all about Hawkins, and I'd never heard of him. But there was just something about his explanations or the way he talked about things that was understandable or helped me put certain things together. So I just, once I read one book, then I was kind of hooked. And that's why he put me in too, Mary. He had a way of pulling things together in ways that I had never heard before. So, mm -hmm. I, I'll, this is this is Virginia. I'll add to that as well. Um, Last night when I was thinking about this presentation, I pulled out my copy of Power Versus Force. And one thing that I love about um, Hawkins is the distinctions that he makes. So in Power Versus Force, he talks about power arises from meaning. And force is something that automatically creates uh, counterforce. So that just was uh, just a really clear distinction for me and explained uh, a lot of what we're lo looking at um, in our world today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very yeah. good, thanks. Yeah, thanks Virginia. 
Final comments. We have a few minutes left. I make a comment about something we talked about um, an hour or so ago, maybe. Um, I think um, John may have mentioned that um, David Hawkins wrote a book with um, Linus Pauling, and something I um, like. I I studied um, like a lot of chemistry when I was you know an undergraduate, and I sometimes I feel like I didn't didn't do that much with it, but it gave me sort of this strangely deep understanding of I don't know the the universe and an example is I took these organic chemistry classes and we spent a lot of time talking about Linus Pauling and molecular orbital theory and the gist of it is like why is like for example why is water a liquid and why does it expand when it freezes whereas like methane which is in natural gas is um it's a gas at the same temperature that water is a liquid and why is that and so linus pauling sort of helped to explain these things it's sort of oddly interesting <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great and uh, bill could probably tell us about why the engineering oh, world yeah. <laughs> why, why the engineering well, I when I studied engineering, there was no quantum mechanics. <laughs> but, but it pulled you in, something about it pulled you in that you found beautiful and... I, I'm sorry, I did good job. Yeah, no, that's all right, Phil. <laughs> we are at time here. Linda, do you need to say anything else? Phil, I gotta say thank you for pulling me into this. This was good for me. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, John. I, I, this could not have happened without you. Uh, <laughs> Just, I really, I'm really so appreciative of uh, your stepping in and, and doing this. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank yeah, you for the association and Linda, thanks for the invitation. Well, thanks, thanks to both of you, um, Phil and John. It was illuminating and edifying and sanctifying. We just really cannot thank you enough. And just a reminder to everyone, later this month, uh, Saturday, February the 27th, we have a program with Dr. Doug Tyler, and he's going to be um, uh, engaging us on some thoughts about technology as shadow. So um, you can register for that at the website. But great applause to Phil and to John. They're just dear, dear hearts. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. It was good to be in your company. Blessings all. And maybe we made it to 493 by now. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Bye bye. Bye, bye guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Don, if it's okay with you, I'll I'll end the meeting for all. Okay. Thank Linda, you. Uh, or somebody mentioned that this will be uh, 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 recorded. Recorded. How, how yeah. we how would we uh, get it? Yeah. Uh -huh. We we'll post that on the website, but um, to, okay. but to you two also we'll send you um, an email with the link. Oh, oh super super. Okay, you that. bet. I, I, I got some I got some family that didn't make it. <laughs> okay, yes. And I have some friends in California who said it was a little too early for them to get up. <laughs> they want they wanted to learn about it. So thank you. Right. Okay. Thanks. Goodbye, thank everyone. You. Peace. Bye now. Bye, Linda. Bye. Bye, Don. Bye bye. Hey Phil.